amazing. And, and for the chapter we're in this morning, John chapter 17, uh, you, you'll be able to, to see the connection of, of having your heart prepared for this chapter. Amen. I'm going to be back and forth between putting the mic in and... So I start with this story. Oh, if anybody needs a Bible, uh, raise your hands and Cameron, our official Bible, Bible hander outer, will hand you a Bible and we'll be in John chapter 17. Just raise your hand high for him. He'll see you. He has the good eyes. One more right here, Camp Fam. So I start with a story, a story of a five-year-old little boy growing up in Mexico City. His dad, an alcoholic, um, very abusive to his mom. So the little boy would have to witness this abuse. So as he's witnessing this abuse, because they get into arguments over how drunk his dad is, and they get into arguments in the and the son, the little boy, would just start crying. And so the dad would turn his wrath onto the boy, this five-year-old little boy, and start hitting on him. This dad would bring this five-year-old little boy to the bars with him. The little boy would fall asleep in one of the nooks, the benches in the bar, as the dad was drunk trying to pick up on women. So the... The, the boy would wake up and he would, he would see his dad and he would see that that's not my mom he's talking to. So the little boy would start crying. And so the woman would look and the woman would say, is that your son? You brought your son to the bar with you? And she'd just storm away from the man. And the dad would tell the little boy, he'd be like, wait till we get home. Wait till we get home. And so we'd go home and he'd whoop the son for, I'm sorry, interrupting the dad's adultery. So the mom had enough. She packed up the kids. She gathered them up. She said, kids, we're moving to California. She took the kids to California. The little five-year-old boy grew up. We'll fast forward to high school. Very violent, very angry from what he witnessed. His mom beating his dad, his mom beating him. One of his friends said that if you weren't his friend, I feel sorry for you because that wrath is coming. So at the end of high school, he ends up joining the Marines. And this was at the time of the Vietnam War. So he gets deployed to Vietnam fights in the war and he describes his first kill. He said he was in a state of shock. He, he, he just didn't know what he just experienced, what he just took part in. So he was seeing his friends stepping on mines, blowing up, getting maimed, no legs. He would have to drag his friends away by their hair because their legs were gone. So then his whole mindset changes. Now he has an enemy that he's fighting in this war. So after kill, after kill, after kill, he ends up having to see one of the military psychologists. All this while he's serving in the military, he's pen pals with this young lady. And through that friendship, through being a pen pal, he ends up falling in love with this young lady. And so he ends up getting honorably discharged from the military, goes back home, beats up with this young lady, goes back home to California, and they end up falling in love together. She ends up getting pregnant. Now this young lady's, her family are missionaries in Cuba, 
So she grew up in a strong Christian home. She ends up getting pregnant out of wedlock. She feels terrible. All the while, her family is praying for this young man to come to the Lord. He's gone to church with them. He's gone up on altar calls and said, yeah, yeah, I gave my life to the Lord. Yeah, yeah. So all the while, this family's praying for them. Well, they end up getting married, have this son, first son, have a second son. Then PTSD, alcoholism, enters his home. His wife ends up saying, I've had enough. Calls him at home, I've had enough. I'm taking the kids. So what does the husband do? He goes and grabs his 22 rifle and an arsenal of bullets. And so he sits, he's waiting at home. Waiting at home for his wife and kids to get home. His plan? To kill his family. And then to die in a shootout with police. That's his plan. We'll pick up this story a little bit later, amen? So in preparation for John chapter 17, I, I tend to like to pick my kids' brains a little bit when, when, when preparing to learn from the Lord. So I ask my kids, I ask them, what does the word legacy mean to you? And Jasmine shared her thoughts. My 17-year-old se daughter shared her thoughts. She said it's what you, what you leave behind. Your legacy is what you leave behind. And she finished her thought by saying, now your legacy could be either good or bad. So here we... In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2... It says, for the joy set before him, for, for the joy set before Jesus, he endured the cross. What is this joy that's being spoken of? This passage we're in, John chapter 17, give us, gives us a window into Jesus' heart. Here we find ourselves in, in John chapter 17. It's most certainly the holy of holies. Jesus is engulfed in the Lord's Prayer. I know, no, I know. It may be a little bit confusing because you say the Lord's Prayer. Wait, that's Matthew chapter 6, right? That's our Father who art in heaven. Well, actually, that was Jesus giving the disciples a model prayer after they asked their Lord to teach us to pray. So if you will, we're going to start reading in John chapter 17. Um, let's stand together, if we can. Now here, the, the, here Jesus, the Son of God, is praying intimately. Oh, to have been there to witness the Son of God praying intimately to his Father. Oh, wait, we are there. Amen. We're here in John chapter 17. So let's put ourselves here. Amen. John chapter 17, verse 1. It says, After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Verse 6, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty 
that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. Verse 9, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I, am, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Verse 12. While I was with them, I protected them, and I kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may be the full measure of my joy within them. Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, they are not of the world, as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Amen. You may be seated. I'm just going to finish off, because the last five verses are... Jesus praying for us. So I really want you guys to soak this in. So I'm going to start off in verse 20. Jesus praying to the Father. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may not believe that you have sent me. So that the world may believe, sorry, that you have sent me. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you may in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Amen. Let's pray. Father, let your word shine forth here this morning. God, stir up these hearts. Stir up hearts, God. Pour your word into us. God, remove me from this place and let your word speak to your people that you've prayed for. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So John chapter 17. It's Jesus' report to his father on his earthly ministry. It's what Jesus is leaving behind, if you will. In John chapter 17, there's eight I haves completed by Jesus. And I'd like to go through these I haves. He's, he's saying, Father, I have done this. So in verse 4, it starts off by saying, I have brought you glory on earth. Jesus telling the Father, I've brought you glory on earth. Verse 4 as well says, I have finished your work. In verse 6, it says, Jesus saying to the Father, I have revealed you to those you gave me. In verse 8, Jesus says, I have given them the words you gave me. These two verses, 6 and 8, we'll dive into them a little bit later. Verse 14, the fifth I have, I have given 
them your words. I have given them your scripture. Verse 18, the sixth I have says, I have sent them into the world. And the seventh I have, in verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me. And the eighth I have that Jesus states to God, Jesus says, I have made you known to them. The title of my message is Jesus, a legacy for certain. You want to leave behind a legacy that glorifies God? Here's the model. Right here in John chapter 17. I like how Shai Lin, Christian rapper, says, he says, producing works that outlive you. So now to zoom in to John chapter 17, we're going to focus on verses 6 through 9. So I'm going to go ahead and read verses 6 through 9 for you. Verse 6 says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. So those, those, those four verses, we're going to zoom in on those, and, and there's some discussion questions on your table. We're going to break away for discussion now for about five to eight minutes, and we're going to dive in to these verses right here. So I'm going to give you guys about five to eight minutes to dive into verses six through nine in John chapter 17. There should be someone at your table with the discussion questions. Amen. Feel free to just pull somebody into your group, too. If you see somebody's not in a group, pull them right in.
We'll go about two more minutes, amen? Two more minutes, we'll wrap it up. Amen, amen. A lot of great discussion going on out there. Um, if we could, if I could just have you back now, but I, I encourage you guys to continue this discussion um, afterwards, and 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 really let the Lord continue stirring you up. Um, so if we could continue now uh, with the message, amen. It's always that awkward little little double dutch moment where you don't know where to break in, or you try to look around and see uh who's right in the middle of their of their thought but thank you guys for coming back with me I, I i do really encourage i saw a lot of talk being stirred up from the lord out there um so i encourage you guys to continue i know eight minutes goes fast right so now in 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 verse 6 of John chapter 17, verse 6 says, I have revealed to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. The New King James Version says this very same verse. It says it like this. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me. The word manifested in the Greek, as you saw in your notes, uh, is a fanaroso, which means to shine forth. Not so much meaning declaration, but illustration. Not so much I have preached about it, but Jesus is saying I have lived it out. Name in the Bible refers to nature. Back in these days, there was much more weight to a name. So name is referring to nature. Paul would say in 1 Timothy 
3.16, Paul says, Great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. Earlier in John chapter 1, verse 14, says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God is not his name. God is his designation. Lord is not his name. Lord is his title. Yahweh is his name. Jehovah. Jesus. Yehovah Shua. Yahshua. Meaning, Jehovah is salvation. Jesus bore the name of the eternal God. Jesus is saying, I have lived out your nature, Father. They have seen you by seeing me. One of the ministries of the Son of God was to declare the Father. It says in John chapter 1, verse 18, the Greek word translated declared means to unfold, to lead, to show the way. Jesus declared the Father. As a dad, I had to pause here in this verse and ask myself, have my kids grown up, fallen in love with the Heavenly Father because the, their earthly father has manifested his name? Have I declared to my family that Jesus is my Lord? Have I led in this manner? Have I shown them the way that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Have I shown my family this? This is when things can get uncomfortable for me. The tough questions. P.T. Barnum says, comfort is the enemy of progress. It's that whole upside down living, if you were right, Christian living, but it's actually right side up living, right? When we're all comfortable, we, we feel like, oh, that's where we need to be. No, it's the enemy of progress. We are not progressing if we're just sitting in our comfort. And so these questions are tough with me. Most of you guys know my story. I like to call this, when I ask myself these tough questions at the end of the day, at the end of the week, I like to call this taking inventory. I'm taking inventory of my life. Asking myself questions at the end of the day when it's just me and God. How, how has the Lord shined forth through my life? Have I been his vessel? Pastor Mike read verse 2 in chapter 17. It says, For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. And he hit on the word authority. And it cut me. Because God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen? Amen. The, author the, the authority I learned growing up was a fear-based authority through intimidation, military style. If you don't do this, this was going to happen, right? And there was a lot happening when I was growing up. I knew no other way until I met Jesus. That, but that was for 40 years now. That was for 40 years before I knew Jesus. So I knew no other way. So 40 years of learning that way. So what's my go-to still now? It's that way. 
until I surrender to the Lord. That's my go-to. It was a proven method. It kept me out of jail. My dad said, if you do this, this, and that, it's going down. And it worked. I thank my dad for that. I, I, I'll come home sometimes, and I, 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 I don't know who can relate here, but I, I come home to my kids, and, and I'm looking for the things that haven't been done as opposed to the things that have been done. You could just ask my family. They'll vouch for it. There she go. My prayer is that I be a dad, a husband, that allows my kids, allows my wife, to experience the freedom that God desires for them while pouring the fruits of the Spirit into them. That's my prayer. And if you'll join me in that prayer um, throughout your week, it'd be much appreciated. Now on to verse 7. Verse 7 says, Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. The disciples at this point in their training know the glorious communion with the Son of Man and God the Father. They know it. On to verse 8. Verse 8 says, For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. They knew Jesus is who he says he is. which led them to believing fully that he's the Son of God. This thought of Christ at this point in verse 8 of his prayer, this thought of Christ has become the apostles' voluntary, spontaneous, assured conviction. Now, word here that's used in verse 8, for I gave them the words, Word here is Ramata, God's word that he pours into you. Throughout studying God's word, he pours his word into us and he prepares us for situations in our lives, for other people's situations that come in our path. He pours into us his word, that very word that the Holy Spirit stirs up in us to pass on to whoever needs it. This is the word Ramata that's being spoken of here. Verse 9 says, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. The word wor world in the Bible has three meanings. The first is here. I am not praying for the world. I'm not praying... The first meaning of world, earth. I have, I have sent them into the world, meaning I have sent them into the earth. The second meaning of world is humanity. For God so loved the world. God loves his creation. And the third being system. Do not love the world or anything in the world. That meaning the world system. Don't fall in love with this world, this system we live in. At this point, he's not praying for the world, for humanity. He's praying for this special group, the disciples. This is Jesus' perfect intercession for us as well. We will see that when we get and we really dive into verses 20 through 25. That's when he's praying for us, the believers. I don't know about you, but I've been absolutely blown away by this passage. God has revealed things to me through his word that through surrender have the potential of 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 major transformation in my life, major transformation in my family's life, the way I 
lead my family the way I love my kids. So now I'm going to pick up that story. The man waiting at his home with his 22 rifle, waiting for his wife and kids to get home. His plan is to kill his family and to die in a standoff with police. In waiting for his family with his 22 rifle in hand, he starts to become impatient. He's, he's getting angry now. He starts just taking the butt of his rifle and just hitting things, destroying things in his house. He takes the butt of his rifle and he just hits the TV. The TV comes on. On the TV is this half bald gentleman talking about Jesus Christ. He's ready to shoot the TV. He's angry. He doesn't want to hear this. He takes aim at the TV. And this man on the TV starts asking the audience if they would like to forget what's behind and start with a new slate, a clean slate. He then continues to share the gospel and the husband drops his rifle, drops to his knees, starts sobbing for the first time in his life, asking Jesus to forgive him and come into his life. He then jumps in his car. He wants to share with his wife the good news. He wants to share the exciting news. I've just given my life to Christ. He's driving around the town. He drives to the church. He's not there. He drives everywhere. He ends up going back home. She's there. He's knocking on the door. He's pounding on the door. I'm sure the wife was like, oh, here we go again. So she opens the door, chain still latched. And he's like, I've given my life to Christ. She closes the door. Just closes the door. She's heard it before. They end up still staying together. It takes his wife a year to finally realize, a year of seeing him, everybody this man is going to, he can't help but share what Jesus has done in his life with everybody he comes in contact with. And so the wife is finally like, okay, this transformation couldn't have happened anywhere but with Jesus. The Reese's start up a Bible study in their home of about seven people, which is now, which is now grown into the congregation of about 15,000 at Calvary Chapel Diamond Bar. Rawl and Sharon Reese are now sold out for Jesus Christ, and God is using them mightily to his glory. Jasmine was right when she said legacy can be either good or bad. Raul Reese said that he couldn't understand how God could use trash like him. I could relate. If this story had ended in the first half of this marriage, then absolutely a bad legacy. But when God takes over a story, takes over a life, that's when it becomes how Billy Graham describes a legacy. Billy Graham says, the greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or other material things, but rather legacy of character and faith. Now that man on the TV that came on when Raul Reese hit it with the butt of his rifle, and he dropped his knees and gave his life to Christ? None other than the late Pastor Chuck Smith, Calvary Chapel, Chapel's pastor. From where Calvary Chapel Diamond Bar and a whole lot of other Calvary Chapels sprung up through God's power, amen? Including Refuge Huntington Beach, who sent a team of bald crazy guys to Long Beach, California, 
to plant Refuge Long Beach. Amen? Amen. I'd like to close by reading from Pastor Chuck's book, A Man God Uses. The first 14 chapters, don't worry, I'm not going to read all 14 chapters. Okay, don't worry, I've, I've held you guys long enough. I'm just going to read the title to the first 14 chapters. Chapter number one, prayer in the man God uses. Chapter two, faith. Chapter three, give God the glory. Chapter four, God's word. Chapter 5, Persecution. Chapter 6, Spirit-filled. Chapter 7, Born Again. Chapter 8, Boldness. Chapter 9, Submitted to God. Chapter 10, Spirit-led. Chapter 11, Uncompromising. Chapter 12, Obedient. Chapter 13, Good Steward. Chapter 14, Faithful Servant. Now chapter 15, the final chapter I am going to read. Chapter 15, its title is The Man God Uses. What kind of man does God use? God uses the man who comes to the cross daily, who has no ambitions for himself. God uses the man whose life brings honor and glory to Christ. God is looking for the person who refuses to seek after the applause of men, who, like Jesus, is centered on submission to God's will. He is looking for that person who is willing to, pre to pre present his body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Are you willing? We are living in the last days before Jesus returns for his bride, the church. And I believe that God wants to give this world one final witness of his love, grace, and mercy before his righteous judgment comes. The prophet Joel spoke of the former reign and the latter reign in Joel chapter 2, verse 23. And I am praying that the Lord would pour out his spirit over the world, that we would see genuine revival. Not a circus atmosphere, which brings attention to man, but in a genuine manner that draws people to Jesus Christ. Since Adam's original sin, God has been looking for a man that he can use to accomplish his purpose. Genesis 5.24 tells us the simple testimony of such a man, and Enoch walked with God. When your life here on earth comes to an end, do you want to be known as a person who walked with God? Are you willing to allow the Holy Spirit to take control of your life right now? During the time of Ezekiel, God searched for a man who would stand in the gap between himself and the sinful nation of Israel. Will you be that type of man? We catch a glimpse of God's heavenly glory in Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah entered into God's presence, Isaiah recorded in verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Do you want God to use your life? Are you willing to say with Isaiah, Here I am, Lord, send me? If so, then it's time to strap on your spiritual armor, pick up your sword, and get in the battle. For the man God uses is willing to be used. God uses men or women who know Jesus with certainty, believe he is who he says he is, then surrenders their life to him. Before using men or women, he calls them. Is he calling you today? If I could please have the worship team come up. Is God calling you today? He'll call you and then use you. If you've heard the good news of Jesus Christ for the first time today, know this, that God has a purpose for your life. No matter where you've been, 
No matter what you've done, God is willing to take over. And all you've got to do is surrender your life over to him. For those who've already made that decision but just want to change the course of your legacy and be that one that stands in the gap, please, all the Lord has spoken to today, pray with me and repeat after me. Let's pray. Father, God, I've sinned. And God, I've been on a path that I've decided to take myself on, that I've been in full control of. God, right now I'm declaring that Jesus is my Lord, my Savior. I'm surrendering that life that I've controlled for so long over to him. And God, I ask that you just take this life over as you have in so many lives. Father, I, 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 I just surrender. I completely surrender with open hands, open arms. I surrender my life to you right now. And I pray, God, that you just take me and love me and give me the purpose that I was created for. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you guys could just sing with me, please. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. One more time, let everybody hear it. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Amen. You know, the good news is that we're saved by grace. It's not by any works. We can't work our way into heaven. We just receive the gift. The free gift that Christ, that Christ paid for us on the cross. Lord, we're so grateful that your grace is enough. Yeah. So this isn't working? better i got a big mouth don't worry about it great is your faithfulness oh god you wrestle with the sinner's heart you lead us by still waters into mercy and nothing can keep us apart so remember your people remember your children remember your promise of god your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough for me your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough 